morning and uh, welcome to Seafood from Scotland Fishmongers Masterclass. I'm Roy Brett from Ondine Restaurant. Today we are going to be focusing on shell to plate and I would love to introduce you to my good friend and chef CJ Jackson. CJ, hi. Hello, Roy. Let me just... Hurrah, can you see me? I can. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry, I was just peering into my computer. What do, what's the weather like up there? It's actually really good today. Yeah, it's, it's it's slightly cool, but really good, but not as good as yours, I hear. I've got yeah, no, we had 23 degrees yesterday. It's very sunny, so uh, it's, uh, it's beautiful. Fantastic. And so, CJ, what are you going to be doing today? Because... Uh, quite interested because I think you've got three or four different things you're up to. Yeah so uh, our uh, topic this week is shell to plate um, and we just wanted to showcase some of the really special product that's available um, out of Scottish waters. Um, what I'm going to talk about is number one which is the lobster. I'm then yep. going to talk about the langoustines but you can see those. Um, I've also got a whelk here. I'm great fans of, of whelks. Uh, for years I always thought they just sat on a a seafood platter but actually they've got the most unusual uses um, and then in wrapped up in here in my little bundle are razor clams which need to be kept like that and I'll explain why when I'm actually talking through them. Um, what are you cooking today because I've got a couple of things to cook but I'm going to start off talking about lobster so are you cooking something specific? Yeah well basically, basically I never managed to get razors today and um, so I've, I've managed to get some lot fine uh, sea farms scallops um i'm going to be doing them with some wild garlic mayonnaise so right. wild garlic asparagus and some exmoor caviar excellent that exmoor caviar um i've tried that it's very good but wild garlic we've got loads of it down here um and it's uh, the the woods just just this lovely sort of gentle aroma of, uh, of that garlic it's just abundant it's fabulous Okay, well, you do scallops. What I'm going to do first, and so I'm just going to talk about the products we've got today. Uh, number one um, are or is um, a hen or female native lobster. Now, native lobsters, we talked about this the other day, um, a very special product, a uh, very special um, shellfish. And um, at the Billingsgate, we have these available, but we also have the Canadian species. Um, and the Canadian species are yet there and available because they tend to be cheaper. Um, and unless you're a Canadian, um, where you'd be very biased to think it's the best thing, um, for us, this is by far, by far, the, got the best flavour. Um, just identifying them, the lobsters always look the same, but for a native, you've got this wonderful uh, sort of white freckling on the shell. This particular one today is a black and blackish blue, but if I turn her around, you can see a little bit around her, her tail here, she's got quite a lot of blue. And the fabulous thing about these lobsters is that they're really affected by or color up in, in their habitat. You get some beautiful blue, you get some black. I've seen pink ones or lilac ones, all sorts of colors. Um, but uh, the, the key thing though, is it's in the shell, it has a heat sensitive pigment. So you cook it and that heat sensitive pigment goes that dark, dark coral color. I have one to show in a minute, but the one I've got, cause that's already cooked. Um, and I just wanted to identify how you, you tell that this is a female. So if I turn her around, this is the tail shell. And on a female, oh, she's not going to like it if I pull her tail out. But on a female, the tail's much wider. It's almost splayed. Um, and in the wild, um, I would just roll her gently onto her side. But underneath there is where she would hold her eggs and berries. Um, in, the, in England, it's actually illegal to land buried lobsters where they're holding onto um, eggs. Um, and I think there's definitely um, uh, sort of motions of foot in Scotland to stop landing them. Uh, and what happens with these is if uh, a fisherman catches one with berries in there, um, back in 2000, they started this project where they V-notch the tail and they cut a little notch out of the tail. It's like cutting your toenails. Um, and they put them back in the water. And from then on, it's illegal to land that notched, uh, notched lobster, but they just do it to the females. So the berries in there, I don't know about you, but when I was training as a chef, we go, oh, hooray, berries, we could add those to a sauce. We don't do that now. I use salmon roe instead, uh, because if it's 
uh, the eggs in there and we're going to produce the next generation. Would you like to guess how old she might be, Roy? Any ideas? Five years, six years old? Uh, probably, actually. I haven't weighed her, but for every 500 grams, you're looking at six to seven years um, or even seven to eight years. So it's, it takes a long time for them to grow. And I know we had a conversation the other week about sizing of lobster because when they land them in, in uh, Scotland and around the UK, they have a minimum landing size. And what they do from the back of the eye socket, which is where my index finger is now, to the base of the carapace here, there's a minimum landing size, depending whether it's come from the Orkneys, the Shetlands, or, or landed into um, other parts of Scotland, that will depend. I think the smallest is about 87 millimeters. Um, and with, uh, the, you know, you learn everything, something new every day. And the thing I learned this week from Seafood Scotland is that they now have a maximum landing size for hen lobsters. Um, and the maximum, again, depends on where they're actually landed. It's anything from about 140 millimeters upwards. If they're smaller than that, they have to put them back. Or sorry, bigger than that, they have to put them back. So it's good. It's a really good sustainable process, particularly uh, when they are, um, you know, a, a valued resource. Um, so you cook with these a lot, um, at, at yeah. Ondines, yes? Yeah, they're really what, what, they, um, what was, Sorry, it's just what difficult would be a typical to, dish for this? Sorry? What would be a typical dish at Ondines with your lobster? Oh, yeah. Lobster Thermidor has always been a really popular, uh, popular yeah. one. Uh, Go on lobster. Um, this week we've just been hit with lots and lots of wild garlic. I'm actually honking a wild garlic right now. Um, so we would just do a nice plain grilled lobster with smoked butter and then yeah. we'd serve it with some fine herbs Fabulous. and some wild, you know, wild garlic. You need butter. so little, don't you, with these? You, absolutely. Um, the other conversation I've had recently is how to dispatch them. And there's a lot of conversations going on at the moment um, about the fact that they need to be dealt with in a humane way. Uh, there's, there's a couple of groups out there, Crustacean Compassion is one of them. Uh, that's actually challenging the way that they're handled um, in the most humane way possible. In the UK, currently, there are no legal requirements. Uh, that may change, so it's something we all need to be aware of. Uh, but looking at what the RSPCA recommend uh, is that in days gone by, they would recommend putting this in the freezer for a while. They're still recommending chilling it but they don't agree with dropping them into boiling water anymore. They expect this to be split. Um, and when I come to dress my lobster in a minute, what I'm gonna do is show you, if you're taking something live like this, where the main nerve receptors are, which is basically underneath this little cross and the carapace. And you have to be very direct, you have to be brave. You need a cloth, particularly if it's live, so you can actually hold down the tail. Uh, so the knife can go in and it's dispatched straight away and it's the, the kindest uh, kindest way to deal with it um and uh, so we'll talk about we'll talk about the preparation of that when um, when i deal with a cook one in one moment so beautiful that's going to go back in my fridge i'm not going to do anything for that now um if i was keeping it at home all i would do just for a short period of time bottom drawer damp cloth over that just to keep it really really cold and to get it very sleepy, packing lots of ice around, it keeps it really, really well chilled. Uh, next one then, absolute top favourite. You can't beat these. And, you know, I think the first time I had them was at a, uh, when I went to Lock Fine. Uh, this is the Langoustine. It's got lots of different names. Uh, if you ask fishermen, they just talk about prawns, uh, Dublin Bay prawn. Uh, if you, the French name is Langoustine. A Spanish name is Cigales. Uh, lots of, uh, of different things. Um, and it is one of the key, if not the key, shellfish landed into Scotland. Um, and if you talk to many people who, who holiday in the Mediterranean, they always see these on the menu and they always think they're from there, but they're not. Most of them come out of Scottish waters. Uh, they're very special. Oh, the other name I didn't mention was Scampi or Scampo, an individual one's a Scampo. Um, and a Scampi is basically just the tail uh, without, the, without the head. Now, interestingly with these, uh, these have been landed, they're dead, but they dip them in a chemical uh, which helps uh, extend the shelf life a little bit. So they're re referred to as a, a dipped langoustine. 
Um, with crustacea, which is what we have with the lobster and uh, crusta um, langoustine here, uh, they get this melanosis, which is this black spotting um, along the side when it's beginning to lose condition. And to, uh, it happens quite quickly. Just to slow that down, they actually dip them in order in a sulfic uh, sort of dip in order to prevent that from just, just uh, basically um, decomposing. Um, and then to cook them, um, all I've done with those, and I've got a beautiful bowl here, and rather large bowl, actually. I'm just rather sort of eyeing these up for my own lunch. Um, so these start out as this colour. I'm going to just show you what I have here. Put that right under the camera. Lovely bowl of uh, boiled uh, langoustine or Dublin bacon. Um, and um, there are two different ways of cooking them. Uh, Jimmy Buchan, who, um, who, I, uh, who I know, um, when he catches them, his boat Amity was one of the big boats that go out for them. His chefs recommended... Um, just uh, putting in, putting into a really hot pan and just frying them off so they create their own juices. Alternatively, uh, just boiled, um, just docked, and they don't take very long. Um, they go into the water, and within two or three minutes, they bob, bob back up to the top, uh, and that would indicate that they're actually cooked. Um, lots of people look at this, and because it's this colour already, if you look at the tail shell here, um, you can tell it's raw because it's quite glassy in appearance. Um, the cooked one, so pick one out here, uh, the tail is not, just to hold that there, the tail is curled around and I can see in the tail here that that meat now um, is white. Uh, and it goes slightly more chalky coloured, uh, still remains the pink. So it's quite glassy and translucent when it's raw and it goes at a slight chalky colour, chalky orange, um, when it's actually cooked through. CJ. But such a special thing, yeah. CJ, um, maybe Irison's asking a question. Um, how long would you keep a live lobster? And secondly, how are these killed? But I wonder if she means the lobster or the langoustine. So you've already told us how you kill the lobster. Well, the other thing is if you, uh, the other method, if you're going to boil a lobster, uh, what they also do is they stun it um, and they use an electric stunner. There's a thing called a cruster stun. Uh, they were very expensive, but to be fair, the price is dropping now. Um, and a lot of big commercial companies would stun the lobster. If they want to cook it, um, they're not going to split it. They're going to have to, so they stun it with an electric stun first, about 10 seconds, takes it to a comatose state, and then you cook it in boiling water. The same thing happens with crab. The one thing about crab, of course, is that you know it's stressed because uh, if it gets too warm or it's upset in any way, distressed, um, the, it drops all its, it shoots its claws, all its limbs fall off doesn't happen so re um, readily with a lobster, but it's a sign of distress. So stunning them and then boiling them. Keeping them live, um, I would say dispatch as quickly um, and as, as, as you possibly can. There's nothing more disconcerting than opening up a fridge and having something looking at you. Um, and uh, so I keep it covered and I would try and um, split it and cook it on the day I buy it. But just keep it very cold, very quiet, um, so it's not distressed um, and then you're ready to go. Okay, so uh, moving on then. So we talked about these. Langoustine can't beat them. Do you know, we, having gone through Brexit, and it's such a difficult time for everybody, I think we need to start calling these Dublin Bay prawns or prawns again. Uh, do you know, I did a program recently, and one of the researchers said to me, um, could you cook British products? And I always cook British product. We need to be eating our British, um, and particularly our Scottish landed um, product. It's supporting the industry hugely. And I said, oh, I'm going to do Dublin Bay prawn. And she said, well, we don't land it. They're not, they're not British. They're not, they're not from our coastline. And that's what people misunderstand. Um, and uh, we need to really appreciate that these are very, very valuable financially, but also very special product. Okay, the next one then. So I've done my crustacea. So crustacea, hinges, joints, legs, feelers, a number of different things moving around. Uh, the next thing we were going to talk about today are razor clams. Now, I know you use these. Um, I got these off the market yesterday and I've left them wrapped for a very good reason. Um, I used to work with one of the shellfish businesses on the market um, when they were a bit short staffed. Um, and when these come in, they leave them wrapped in paper. Uh, the paper's damp. And then when you unwrap the paper, you will find these held together with an elastic band. One of the biggest mistakes you can do is unwrap it, take the bands off and lay them out on a tray. It reduces their shelf life um, double quick time. So if you keep them cool, wrapped in paper, all bunched together, um, they're, they're very comfortable like that. And as I said, the shelf life 
uh, will uh, be very, it will be, will extend nicely. Um, so with these, um, they're a bivalve mollusk, which means they're in a double or hinge shell. I'm just going to extract one. The razor, the idea of a razor is the fact that it's like an old fashioned razor. Um, like our, all bivalve mollusks, you need to be checking that the shell will hold uh, tightly shut. I'm running my finger along there at the some action. Um, but because they've got very brittle shells, you need to be quite careful with anything that's got a broken shell. And if it does have a broken shell, um, I would normally, certainly with, uh, with things like um, mussels, automatically discard them. You can't risk them. Um, these, uh, they, they used to fish for them um, in a variety, variety of different ways. Um, and what's happened with them is the price has doubled in the last three or four years. They're very expensive now. Um, and I was going to ask you how you might prepare it. Can you tell me what you might do with it? Well, uh, yeah, it. firstly, um, Brian's asking a question. He misheard um, when you were saying, uh, did you say that Langustines aren't British landed, but they are British landed, Brian? They are. Absolutely. Yeah. They are British landed. Yeah. They're one of our key, um, one of our key um, uh, species. So they, they're Dublin Bay prawns. They catch them. Um, around, there's loads in the Murray Firth, a really, really big fishery for it, and a, you know, and a successful fishery. That fishery has been challenged hugely because uh, because of this horrible pandemic, mm. so many people have been affected, and of course, people aren't travelling to the Mediterranean now, and there's a big market for them. So we need to be using more of them. Uh, they're still they're still quite expensive, but I have watched the price drop, and we do need to be utilising them as best we can. Okay, what other, uh, thank you for thank that. You that was from Brian, okay. So yeah, I, I was actually going to do my razor clam dish today just, just to be on point in season and just, we're getting the first of our English asparagus up um, and also there's French asparagus available. So we, we normally do a, a razor clam starter uh, with wild garlic just uh, sauteed off in the same pan, but we open the razor clams with the juice from the asparagus stalks. So when we right. pop that open, and then we just, we add a little bit of butter into there, and then we just add a little bit of like finely sliced ham on and some fresh peas. So it's just a nice, it's, it's, it's just a, a seasonal dish, and it just varies all the time. And we, we do the La Plancha style for the hot shells. Yeah. And then we clean the razors completely for the fruits of the sea, because, you know, the, you know, just to take out the sack, etc. so people don't have, uh, have to go through that. In, uh, in Spain, they eat everything, but you remove, so you cook them and then remove the sack and just leave the mussel in the middle. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And how long do you cook them? Because I, uh, when I cook them at the market, um, they take a minute. They're so, and then suddenly you've got the beautiful, sweet, succulent meat. Um, cook it for 30 seconds too long and you're just chewing on an elastic band. They're really tough. So I wonder what your thoughts were on that. So you, you steam them, do you? Yeah, I just like, I just put a little bit of, um, like for the, that dish that you're doing today, I, I would be just adding, which the dish I'm going to be doing later with asparagus, I just put the uh, asparagus juice into the pan with the asparagus, with the razor clams at the same time. And right. take the, the razor clams out first, and then about a minute later, I bring out the asparagus. And then I make an emulsion from the juices that came from the asparagus and the razor clam. Okay, that sounds delicious. Well, I, I was talking about um, using them for ceviche, actually, but, you know, you have to be very careful. You know, you know they're alive. You know what you're dealing with. It's a little bit like eating an oyster, I think, actually. Um, but anyway, the next one I wanted to talk about are these fabulous whelks. Now, I'm, um, I come from um, a sort of a, a, an East End family, actually. I'm Kent, and I sound terribly Kentish, but um, my East End family. And, and in London, the East Enders would have a big shellfish platter for Sunday tea. And on that, they'd have whelks, they'd have little periwinkles or winkles, they'd have a range of things. And I'd always seen one of these and just presumed that it was boiled. This has been cooked. Actually, no, that one hasn't. What am I talking about? Let me get one that's been cooked. Here we are. That one's live, actually. So what I did with these was I cooked them. Um, you need to wash them really well because they are absolutely full of grit. And I washed them in several changes of water. Um, and then I dropped them into boiling water. Um, and then cook them. Now these, this is for me, I'm just going to just peel it out of its shell using a, um, a, a seafood pick. Uh, you peel it out of its shell and right at the base you're going to get something a bit gritty, which I would automatically need to curl it out of the shell. 
Uh, little periwinkles or winkles, um, you can only re really extract with a pin, but this is uh, this has come out nicely. And here, where my fingers are now, that's actually quite gritty, and I tend to, uh, to remove that. And at the top here, you have like a little foot or little stopper. It's the operculum, um, and that also needs to be removed. Obviously, this is cooked now. Um, and for cooking these, this for me is about the maximum size I'd want to go. You can get great whopping things. Um, but, um, you know, we, we always think about methods of cooking and cooking stew long and slow. It, it uh, actually tenderizes them. And I tried steaming or stewing these for two hours and they were just as tough then as they were when they come out now. So this size had about, about 10 minutes in the pan. Um, and then just rinsed uh, and just picked over. And, and that in there, there's quite a lot of grit in that part there. It's been actually just removed. Um, and traditionally, you just pull that out, vinegar and salt, and in it goes. Now, the big market for whelks um, in uh, Billingsgate is actually the Korean market. The Koreans love conch. Uh, it's a big, big shell. This is uh, in a single shell, a sea snail. It's also known as a gastropod or univalve. Um, and in a conch, it's... 10 times the size of this, but they're very endangered. We occasionally see them coming into the market out of the shell frozen, but it's on sustainability front, front it's not a good thing to be, um, to be looking at. So the Koreans come in, into the market, buy a 10 kilo bag of these, and then they do a classic dish where they, um, they actually cook it with uh, salt belly uh, or belly pork um, and uh, lots of curry and a, a sort of four or five hours in the oven. And it seems to be a, a sort of a classic dish, big Korean dish. Koreans eat a lot of sea snails. They also like orma, you know, the abalone is a big thing as well. So they're popular. Now, fairly recently, I had a, a session uh, talking to um, a friend who's an Italian Michelin starred chef. Um, and he saw these on the market. Uh, he's from Milan and he got terribly excited uh, about cooked whelks. And winkles, and in his um, in his village, there by the sea, um, they have two particular recipes for these. And I've actually put one together. I'm going to bring that round. I think the pan's a bit hot. Um, and what what he does with those is he makes a ragu, uh, and then tosses a whole lot into pasta. So for my um, my ragu here, I've got pancetta, uh, tomatoes which I've been cast. I've added my pasta to that, but I've also got lots of fennel, wild fennel, and great handfuls of it go in there. Um, and then a good splash of wine, and then you add your whelks to heat through and just toss the whole lot in pasta. I did the same using winkles. Um, take, cook them. You have to cook them and take them out of the shell, and winkles are really fiddly. Um, and then they go into this big ragu uh, with a troffier, which is a little curls of pasta, um, and they put loads and loads of rosemary with it. And... I made it and gave it to the merchants on the market and they couldn't identify that it was a fish dish because you've got, oh. you've got the pancetta in there. Um, and I've chosen these, uh, these whelks here are quite small. They were boiled, they've been extracted from the shell. And all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pop those through and just heat them in my, into my, uh, my ragu. I'm gonna pop them back on the stove for a moment whilst I go about dressing and looking at splitting the lobster. CJ. I'm just looking at the time. I think we're all right for time still. Yeah, I've got two questions, CJ. Yeah. Um, one, one question comes from Rosemary Williams. Do you uh, suggest freezing uh, the whelks to tenderise them? Um, um, that's a really good thought because I know we, we certainly consider that when we're uh, looking at cooking the cephalopods, so squid and octopus and cuttlefish. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and actually, I've never tried it, although I do know that McDuff, Scottish um, seafood company do the best frozen whelks. I've had them. They're cooked and out of the shell. I've used them before. And I have a great friend who is a huge whelk aficionado. And I got them from McDuff in a frozen bag. And he said they were the best he'd had. So those are the ones. Um, it's McDuff just up the road from. Yeah. Up well, there's, um, there's another question. Do you purge the whelks? We normally purge them. Do you normally purge your whelks? Yes. So what I would do is a good question, actually, because what I, they need several changes um, mm -hmm. of water uh, because they throw out so much grit. Um, and then what I would do in the last change of water, just for a moment or two, is just add a bit of salt. Uh, and that's what I would do with them, but not for a huge length of time and then boil them. So lots of changes of water because, as I said, they're pretty filthy when they come out of the water. And Any also, other questions? Yeah, Clark Communications, they're just asking how you would prepare, prepare the whelks. Um, 
I think you've just been through that, haven't you? Yeah, so washed, uh, several changes of water, salt in the last wash, probably three or four minutes, um, and then straight into boiling water uh, to Did cook. You, them. What we normally do as well, CG, is that, you know, I was always uh, taught to overemphasize the amount of salt in the water. So you're just getting that sea, sea salt water sort of yeah. comes through, uh, through the welts. And just like a lot of crustaceans, just to, um, you know, like when we cook lobsters, langoustines, welts, cockles, we always add that little bit extra salt. You do. Um, I think originally they probably would have been cooked in salt water. Uh, one of the um, fishmongers I work with, he likes to quite heavily salt the water and put a good couple of tablespoons in there. Uh, what he reckons that does is it helps extend the shelf life once it's cooked in, in the fridge. So if he's mm. going to put it on his uh, display, he maintains it's, uh, it's a better thing. Um, I cooked the langoustine this morning and langoustine is so sweet. Um, I actually very often use the water that I cook them in as a base for, for stock. Um, and therefore um, with something like, some of these are too gritty for that. But the langoustine water is, without the salt, is absolutely gorgeous as a, st as a stock bait. Excuse me, I'm hiccuping. Um, okay, so here I have a cooked lobster. Now this one is a male, I've chosen the male. He's got a nice tightly um, tucked in, in shell. Uh, my hen had a, a wider shell. Um, there's actually no difference, I don't think, between the male um, and the female lobster. Uh, but if it's a female, you want to double check that it's, there's no um, berries or eggs in there. Um, if you look at uh, crab, brown crab, a uh, hen crab is always much sweeter than a brown um, than uh, the, the cock, but the cock has much larger claws. We use all that lovely white meat. Um, we, we talk, I talked to earlier about the different types of, of lobster. This was Canadian. Um, it doesn't have the white fretting on the shell. You can see um, the heat sets of pigments gone that beautiful coral color, but the white freckling remains white. If this was a Canadian lobster, it would have gone a solid color. The carapace here is a little bit more bulbous on a, a Canadian lobster. And also Canadian lobsters tend to have a slightly softer shell. Um, the, um, the native lobsters or the Scotch lobsters um, have a much, much harder shell. Uh, and cooking wise, I've looked at, um, cooked with one or two chefs over the last year or so, ignore that, we've had a pandemic over the last couple of years. Uh, and um, some of them cook them for only seven or eight minutes. And for me, it's not quite long enough, particularly if it's a hen, because you need to cook it enough to cook the coral or, or the roe in the middle. Now, um, CJ, cook yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, That's all right. Brian's asking the question, so cooking shellfish in sea, sea, sea water now is becoming less common. Um, no, you don't want to do it. You have to, I wouldn't cook it in sea, in sea water. You have dread to think what's in there. Um, you need to create your own sea water. And the same salinity, um, you get about two, uh, I think it's about an ounce or a 30 grams of salt uh, to a litre of water, which gives you a very, very similar, no, I, sorry, ignore that. It's 36 grams of salt to a litre of water, gives you a very, very similar salinity that you just expect in the sea. So you took a mouthful of sea water with all the rubbish in it. Um, and then you've got, um, you, you can create your own. So that's what I would use. Does that, does that clar clarify that? I think it does, yeah. I, we, we used to use the seawater, I think I said to you before, down in Padstow. And then that was a long time ago. That was 18 years ago. So uh, Yes, and they're probably cleaner down there. But mind you, having said that, some of the cleanest waters up in Scotland, uh, not where I live, it's pretty horrible. <laughs> Okay, so imagine that this is, this is what the RSPCA would recommend for splitting them. So imagine this is live, um, and therefore you've got to be fairly careful to hold the tail. I'm just gonna grab a, a tea towel, got one of my CP Scotland tea towels. And what you want to do is you'd hold out the tail uh, and just hold it down like that. And then just underneath the, um, the carapace here, you've got a nice cross and what you want to do, don't split it that way. You need to put the tip of your knife right on that cross where you've got nerve receptors underneath. You press it down and then you split it straight away, turn it round and then cut it in the, other, up, in the opposite direction. So in, fortunately this isn't gonna squirm or split, but you need quite a powerful hand just to cut that open um, and ready. Um, I'm gonna just use scissors to finish the tail but you need to be quite direct and firm with it. 
in order to, uh, to be able to split it well. Inside then, I'm just gonna look at what you don't want. So I wanna keep that meat in the tail shell, although you can take the meat out and whatever you need to do with it. Um, obviously this is a male, so there's not gonna be any row in there, but what we do have right underneath my fingers here, I'm just gonna lift it out, um, is actually the tomini, which is the liver. And that for me is one of the, the nicest parts. It's like the brown meat that you get in a crab. Um, and I would mix that uh, into, I'm, I'm doing a, a class doing lobster thermidor um, on a webinar with Seafood School on Saturday. Um, and I'd mix that in uh, with the, the sort of thermidor base and sauce. We're also doing lobster Newburg, which has got Madeira and brandy um, and that sort of thing going in with it, creme uh, and double cream. Um, with CJ, this, I'm also going to, yeah. Sorry, CJ, uh, I've got a quick question to answer. Katie Slack is asking, how would I prepare live lobsters? I would just take them out one at a time and split them through the head as quickly yep. as possible. Try to keep the lobsters also uh, covered, Katie, the other ones. So, you know, you take one out and then take one out as opposed to doing them all at the same time. Um, it's really well, important, you know, I had, a, I, I had two and I was splitting them and I split one and the other one hid underneath the tea towel. So they're very aware, you know, of, you know, I think we need to be quite sort of, you know, it's an animal, it's something we eat. We just need to be aware of that sort of thing. But do one at a time, split it, deal with it, um, clean it. Um, obviously, if this was live, you'd still got a lot of muscle contraction um, around, uh, around the tail end, but you've gone through those major nerve receptors. Um, uh, which, as I said, the RSPCA maintain we need to be focusing on at the moment. At some point, we may all have to stun them first. Uh, that might become a, a legal requirement at some point. We just need to be aware of, and looking at changes, you know, I was sort of talking to Claire from CP in Scotland a little bit earlier today, and the most important thing when you're looking at preparing, um, you know, working with these live things um, or working with anything is to keep updated. You know, it's like looking at the Marine Conservation Society list um, I learn something new every day. And the new thing for me was the, the maximum light landing size for those female lobsters. So reading and being informed, there's no excuse uh, for ignorance in that respect. And just keep on, on top of it. The other group that's are very good and very helpful is the Shellfish Association of Great Britain. Uh, there's a guy that runs that tap chat called David Jarrett. He's very knowledgeable um, and he, he's there to support the industry um, around the UK, uh, Scotland and, uh, and England and Wales, and he's there to support uh, the industry. So it's really important that uh, people keep in the loop and just don't think, oh, I've always done it like that. That's how I'm always going to continue doing it. Now, I'm just looking at timing here. Um, the, what I, the, just thinking about what I, uh, what I want to remove. And then whilst I remove this and fiddle around with it, I know you're going to cook. Um, but having split the lobster, and it's now ex it's expired, um, what I want to do is pull out the stomach which is close to the head. It's the same thing. Uh, there's a little bit of shell in there. The stomach will have its last meal. That wants to come away. And the other thing, I'm using a seafood pick here, is just to look for, if there is one, uh, your digestive tract, which you would see in a prawn as well. It's the digestive tract, it's gritty. Uh, it's not very nice. The tomale I'm gonna lift out and just, um, if I was going to mix that with something, I might put some mayonnaise with it. Um, and if you want to lift it out completely from the shell, um, underneath the head shell here, if I pull off the pink membrane, you've got all your gills or your dead man's fingers underneath there. Um, and if you're being really nice to, uh, to whoever you're serving it to, I'd automatically pull all those away. I would take the meat out of the tail shell. I'm going to do this uh, and then just assemble the two together. And then I'm going to put, crack the claw meat. I've got a big mallet for that and pull the meat out and then slice up my lobster to put back in the shell um, with a little bit of tomini over the top. So I'm looking at the time because we, you want to have time to cook. So why don't I carry on doing that um, and get it ready in the shell? I'm just heating through my, my well. It's ready to serve up and then I'll have a, a few moments. So are you nearly ready to go? Yeah, I can start now, actually. Yeah, all good to go. Okay, thank you. Seafood Scotland is the trade body for the Scottish. Yeah, so you've got, you have got your Scottish uh, seafood, but um, I often refer people to the SAGB just purely because uh, they've got lots of, you know, knowledge, particularly about shellfish. Right, okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you, Roy, if that's all right. I want you to tell me what you're doing whilst I'm um, picking over my, my lobster here.
I, I hope it's not going to detract. It might be that the, the, the team wanted to cut me off at this point so that we're not detracting from um, for your, your preparation. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to cook a super simple dish today, uh, completely in season. Uh, I've got some pepper scallops from Jamie at Lockbine Sea Farms. Um, I'm just going to prepare this nice and quickly. So, got scallop on the bench. Got the knife, one in, put in the seat down, and through. As you can see, look, we just got these there uh, from Gary Welsh this morning. So, I'm not going to be using the roe for this dish. What do so you do it, with your rows? Well, normally we, we, we dehydrate because no. of coral butter. That's our normal practice. So we'll be doing a, a coral butter and some wild garlic. Just because I've got so much wild garlic, CJ. Oh, yes. No. <laughs> yes, we're abundant. We just need to make the most of it. Um, I've made a lovely uh, pesto with that wild garlic, and it's just everything gets dulled in it. So I'm just moving, removing the scallops completely from the so shell. Are you taking them out of the shell? Yeah, just for this dish, you know, because all, of, all I'm looking for is just the meat. So these are like medium-sized scallops, they're not, not large, but these are the size that we want for this dish. And I would give these a good little rinse uh, for 20 seconds and then put them on drying cloth just for the course of time. I'll start preparing the start of the dish. So how the dish starts is with the asparagus, because that takes quicker time to cook. So I'm just taking the, the pan up to a medium heat and what I've got in here, if you can see, I just got the, the stocky bits from the asparagus and uh, I just blended them down with some water yeah. and a little bit of seasoning and that goes in. So you've got this, this just a, a vegetable stock, you know, and how many times that we actually throw out the base points of the asparagus and uh, they just discarded them of the vegetables. Yeah. I like to use it as a sort of starter point to the dish. Just a little bit more. Now I know the pressure you're under, CJ, because uh, normally I'm just gassing away or trying to butt in, and then when it's when it's your turn. No, 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 it's fine. It's just it's so <laughs> not good to see you cooking. Actually, is that an induction hob you're working on? Yeah, I'm not actually. I'm, bizarrely enough, the, the kitchen's just next door, and I'm doing it here because the the light in the kitchen wasn't for, for filming, so. Anyway, just lifting up. Can I just say that Gordon has just asked me how long I cook the lobster for? Uh, it's mm -hmm. a really good question, actually. For that, can I just add that in whilst you're doing a little bit more prep and then I'll ask you yep. what you're doing in two seconds? That'd just be all right. Just, just going in, yep. Um, so, so what have you just put in there? Sorry. So the asparagus is just oh, Asparagus, in. okay. Uh, so lobster, lobster for, for my native lobster, I would normally cook it between 11 and 12 minutes per 500 grams. Um, if it's bigger, and I think for me, I know we talked about the sizing, I prefer to sort of stick between eight, 800 and a kilo, much bigger than that. And as we discussed, the shell, we talked about this the other day, the shell's thicker when they get bigger. Um, and I think that um, 500, 500 grams is probably um, 10 to 12 minutes, actually. But again, it gets bigger, it gets softer shell, you know, a thinner shell. As it gets bigger, I go for the 12, 12 minutes uh, for each 500 is what I would do. And reheating it, so difficult to reheat crustacea. I don't know how you would do that, Roy, but I would make my basic sauce and then drop the prepared um, the prepared lobster or whatever, prawn and langoustine into it just to warm it through to make sure it's piping hot, but not back in for three or four minutes because you end up with something that's yeah, salty, it doesn't... horrible yeah. flavor. You need to be just very, very careful and gentle with it. We kind of played around okay. with it a lot, CJ, when we were um, doing ondine at home because the products went to the house, it's prepared and then we had to do a lot of time tests just to make sure that the lobster's not over or it's heated right through enough. And the biggest one that we always say is just make sure you take it out and enough time out the, the fridge to come up to temperature. Put the asparagus in here. I've added a little bit of wild garlic, a little bit of smoked butter. Do you make your own smoked butter? No, I don't, no. No, not at the moment. So I'm just 
Let me turn that up slightly. So can I ask Ooh. where you get your smoked butter from? It's one of my I'm afraid of a bit of a, a butter cream. I actually get it from Wellox down in uh, James Wellox. Right. Um, they're, they're really, really good service. And they, at, at the moment, at this time of the year, in terms of like French morels, asparagus, garagui, um, strawberries, they're completely on point. So you can see here, this is just coming together nicely. Lovely. So how long have we poached those for? Uh, for about a minute and a half. So now I'm just going to take this off the heat just now and plan for the scallops. So I've got three, three of uh, Jamie at Lockbind scallops, which are prepared earlier. So with the preparation of those, Roy, can I just say that when they come out of the shell, you yep. very often get that little dark muscle, uh, which yep. a lot of fishmongers leave on just purely for the weight. A lot of chefs yeah. eat off. I actually quite like it. It's meaty and it's got a quite sweet flavour. But from, from your fine dining situation, would you would normally remove those? You know what? It's actually a good point because it's funny you say fine dining. I think the word that I, I like to most that Tom Brown's using just now is fun dining. Oh, yes, that's much better. Fine dining sounds far too posh. It's so boring, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, so it is. It's, it's yeah, smacked it's of, uh, you know, sort of the 19 sort of 70s and 1980s. Yeah, so fun dining, very good. Yeah, I approve of that. So, okay, so, so how are you cook, cooking them? What oil have you used? So I've just used some rapeseed oil, some cold yeah. fresh um, rapeseed oil. Seasoned up pretty well. And then go into the pan. And how long are you giving them? You're pressing them on. A minute and a half. Minute and a half, Maximum, okay. Nothing more. So they've got direct a contact. Bit of butter the just for caramelization. Yeah. So is that a minute and a half in total? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm no doubt I'll get time when I was a minute and a half out. <laughs> so they're not, I can you know. smell you can them from them. here, Roy. Sorry? I can almost smell them from here. They look gorgeous. Well, in the room, I think she's bagged them for her for her lunch. So you removed the coral and dehydrated them. Yeah. Uh, what would you uh, do? You add those to, that to sauces and beast reductions, that sort of thing. Yeah, we do. Got a nice little bit of caramelisation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I try to use everything, CJ. Everything that we've got, you know, I just don't think there's much point. Um, having the product and then just not using and utilizing it to its most, you know. Have you used the skirt of the scallop before? You know, the, the frilly edge. I know, um, yeah, well, I think it was Mark Hicks used to deep fry them and they end up a bit like bacon rind. Yeah, I there's, a, there's a rule up here not to be using the skirt. So I've just added a little bit of lime juice to it. That's what I was looking yeah. for. And now it's quite good because you're using an induction, cook your asparagus, then you then you cook your scallops, and now it's my table. Perfect. So to assemble the dish, it's got a couple of wild garlic, as I did earlier. So I just made a wild garlic mayonnaise. Oh. <laughs> it's the smoke. Ignore it, just ignore it. Oh, right, I'm just going to carry on as the, uh, the fire engines come. <laughs> Can I ask, did you blanch the wild garlic for the mayo or did you just whiz it? What did you do to get it clean? Say that again so I can't hear you because of the fire alarm. Okay, um, what did you do to the wild garlic? Did you blanch it um, in order to get it clean? Yeah. Did you wash it? What did you do with it before it went into the mayo? So I rinsed, I I rinsed off the in some salt water, cold salt water, bring it out and blanch it, refresh yeah. it nice, and then I, I dry it, I squeeze dry Perfect. it. Perfect. Okay. I'm actually going to have to silence this for a second. Give me one second. It's always the way 
uh, the seafood school, when we're searing things, particularly when we're doing squid or cuttlefish in the hottest pan, uh, where you've almost got it, you need to have it so hot it's smoking, all of the alarms go off and it's a little bit disconcerting, but hopefully you'll be back in a minute. Whilst Roy's just plating that up, I'm just going to go back to what I've got here. Um, my lobster, Roy, I'm just chatting for two seconds. Um, the lobster, what I would do with this, I'd crack the claws for the guest um, and then just give them an old fashioned um, seafood pick uh, with a bib and they can then uh, pick through that themselves. Um, with my whelks, that's in my pasta dish. Uh, with whelks and pasta, or any shellfish and pasta, the Italians wouldn't put cheese anywhere near that. Um, it's tomato-y. I can cast the tomatoes when they went in with the pancetta. It's got a lovely smoky flavour, and you want to add a good splash of wine to create a really nice juicy texture to that. Um, and Roy, are you, can I just carry on talking about opening up a, a magazine, or are you ready to just do your final da-da moment? Okay, studio team, I hope you can still hear me, even if Roy's gone a bit quiet. Um, I'm hoping, Roy, can you hear me? Yep, hi, I'm back. Oh, right, okay, fantastic. Thanks, Epi, you're on mute. <laughs> right, so anyway, I've just got uh, a little bit of the caviar to go on top of the scallop. So this is Exmoor caviar. Been using it quite a lot, CJ. And then I've got some residual juices just to dress over. Just a tiny amount, nothing too much. A little bit more asparagus just to keep it nice and on point. It's so key, isn't it? Just making sure that things are not overcooked. But I love it when they're still slightly glassy in the middle. That's it. As it is. Excellent, gorgeous, gorgeous. Well, can I, um, I can I just show you my my langerstein because I'm afraid I've got a rather big bowl here and I'm rather greedily looking at them because I'm I'm on my own here today. But yeah. I've, I've got sriracha mayo um, in there. Yeah. Um, and for my langerstein, all I'm going to do is just do this just in front. Snap off the head. Uh, there's lots of lovely meat in there, so I'd use a teaspoon. Trying to get a little bit closer so you can see to pull that out. And then to unravel these, you want to pinch them um, so you can actually hear them snap. Have you heard that? And then yep. you want to take off the top two uh, layers. Now, if you don't cook these very well, what happens with them is they go quite powdery. And if they're beginning to age a little bit, sometimes the frozen ones can be a bit powdery and they're a bit disappointing. But I've already cooked one of these today and tried it. As I had to taste it, obviously. Um, I'm unraveling those. These shells will also make really good basic stock again for risottos. I'm just unraveling that and look at that gorgeous meat. I just pull the tail shell away and there it is. Oh my goodness. Dipped into there. Can't win. It can't beat. Can't beat it. Okay. So who's eating your scallops today? Um, I think Claire's going to eat them. She's uh, she's already back. Oh, she, oh, good. She deserves that. She I think deserves or it might be Fireman Sam's in second in queue. If he comes in first, quite grumpy, I think I'll have to feed the fire service first. But uh, bloody hell, imagine that happening, eh? Never mind. It's always, it's always the restaurant. Yeah, uh, the first time I did a cookery demonstration in a village hall, there was a big bang and the, the, the gas went off. So everything had to be done from raw. You just have to smile and get on with it. Um, so, any other questions, Roy? Anybody specifically wanting any more knowledge? Because there's so much fabulous shellfish uh, in Scottish waters, um, and we, you know, as we all know at the moment, we, uh, we're all in the same boat with the hospitality industry, the same at the school, but we need to be back looking at these and supporting industry and ringing the changes. We talked about that last week, but using lots of different things. So, any other questions? There's quite a lot of questions just coming through. Uh, what do you do with the razor clams and Roy and CJ, would it, there be the number of species you would recommend to put on the menu to help encourage diners to eat more UK shellfish? Very good question. And is there a playback? I'll ask the, the tech guys to, I'm sure there is, so you can, you'll be able to see this again. 
And what would be really good is for somebody in Scotland to get an idea of. Sorry. And are you insured for fire? Yes, I am. Okay, someone's asking about advice on how to respond to people who've um, hopped on Netflix seaspiracy documentary. Do you know? I'm um, having dealt with the media in the past. Um, particularly TV, they've got to have a lot of sensation on there to make it watchable, and it's shocking. Uh, it's like the the dreaded um, royal interview recently. It's all, all about shocks and horror. What we have to understand is that it's it, they basked it a lot of really bad practice together, but there's also a huge amount of positive stories. We need to be supporting the industry. We need to be eating, but this is all about eating as seafood. It's just ringing the changes. A couple of portions of seafood. Do you know, I did a, um, a, a calendar a few years ago when I chose, um, I had every single type of shellfish I could get from the market. Um, in that one year, I only needed to eat cod once. Um, there were so many other th options. Um, and I think it would be good to come up with, somebody was asking about a list of other shellfish that's available that you can put on the menu. Um, there's, I think it's just talking to the supply base and the fishermen, but there's so many different things. And I think, um, you know, we've, if, I'm excited about getting back out there and uh, working with these. And I'm very excited about eating this in a minute. <laughs> um, but I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think I think sea spirits is, you know, like all, like fish to, uh, fish to fork, but end of the line with Charles Glover, you know, yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's good to watch um, because you, you have to make your own opinion. I, I, you know, I just... Um, it does highlight a lot of good points about, you know, who to, who to trust and who to believe. Um, but then it, it's a, it's one person's take on a huge industry, and there can be no denying that there's uh, a lot of ill practice around the world, and of it course, has to be addressed. Absolutely. But, um, um, Aitha, you know, who is marketing at Seafish, released a very good, um, you know, d discussion about it, and it's shock tactics but that's what makes good tv you know and uh, and i think shocking it you know it absorbs people um but it's um, it, it's not very helpful for the good stories and there are a lot of good stories out there as well and thinking about sustainability and trying to be uh, cautious about what we're we you know what we're using but also you know supporting an industry is so important well on that point i would say that the word sustainability it, it shouldn't be used as a buzzword you know to fill restaurants or regional yeah. local you know make sure it is regional make sure it is local that, that's what we've all got to do you know and it's that if you if that's if that's what you're using as your mission statement it's really really important to to, to follow it through yeah well i think uh, you know people often I, mean, I had a discussion with somebody the other day and i said you know when did you think the word sustainability became the big word and he went oh 20 years ago but actually we were very aware of landing sizes, you pedal back to the middle of the 19th century. In the 1880s, they had a minimum landing size for oysters and for crab. Um, and actually, we're going to be next week. We're going to be looking at um, native oysters and talking about seasonality, which will be our, our next topic. Um, but I think it's um, you know, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn, uh, and it's such a big topic with seafood. Well, I might just leave the cooking to you from now on. Why? Because <laughs> I set my bloody place on fire. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, I've got a dog in the house, so at least the postman didn't come past and start barking. Um, anyway, any other questions? I mean, really appreciate everybody joining this. Um, you know, Seafood Scotland are there to support all the fishermen and the industry and to give out information to get more Scottish product on, on our plates. And 12,000 miles worth of coast, I got very excited about that. Or is it 12,000 kilometres of coastline? I got very excited about that. Um, and I can't wait to come up and have your scallop dish. Somebody asked whether you always have scallop scallop on the menu, Roy. Yeah, you? but yeah, I've, you know, like I've, you know, I've got uh, Jamie's scallops today. Uh, I've also got a batch coming in from Guy Grease, and um, from Ethical Shell Shellfish Company. Andrew Fairley and I were the. I think he went to Andrew's first, and then came to our door second. I think Andrew sent them down to me, and uh, we've we've always tried to buy like the diver scallops and. You know, so yeah, absolutely, absolutely adore scallops. We do it in different formats. To be honest, I did this today because I'm not in the kitchen and I did it out the shell. I far more enjoy cooking in the shells. That you know, the 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 nat It's just like your natural plate, and I, I love food yeah. in that sort of 
natural format. It's just the way that Ondine's always cooked and how I've kind of, I like to seafood, but seafood, that's not fun. But just, um, it was actually taking the shells, out, <laughs> the, the scallops out of the shell today was quite different for me. Yes, uh, well, I know, I, and I think you're taking them out of the shell. Um, it's interesting, Seafood Scotland have just posted a link um, with Seafish's uh, approach to the sea spiracy, um, and uh, that link would be very useful. If you're interested to know a bit more and to get your own thoughts, uh, that's really worth looking at. Anyway, Roy, I think we're nearly out of, oh no, still got a few moments. Is anything else coming up? Um, let me see. And please There's join us next here. week we're talking about seasonality and one or two other things. Yeah, look, uh, there's a question here, given that crab, this is from Mary Erison, I hope I said that right. Uh, given crab is such a big export, how could we get more people to eat it in the UK? Well, brown edible crab, I think is pretty popular. It's the other crabs, it's the velvet crabs um, on all those bits and pieces. Um, I think it's, if you've been brought up with it, you, you have a a feeling for it. I mean, I don't know about what your first memory of eating particularly shellfish was like, Roy. I remember uh, winkles and I also remember uh, freshwater crayfish um, as a child, hand-picking them. And I think um, educating uh, children um, uh, about eating it. I had somebody the other day who was very squeamish about shellfish or eating any fish, but he hadn't, he'd come to eating fish very late in life. He was in his late 20s and he's quite squeamish about it. Um, I, I was speaking to him the other day. So it's getting people in early uh, and in, encouraging. So take off the chicken nuggets off the menu and put something that's good, that's uh, a little bit more than a goujon on a plate for a child and just, you know, see, just open up their eyes to a different world, I think would be one way. No, okay. spot on there. Harry, thank you for that. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It's great for us because, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, support the industry as best we can. Hi, Gary. Come back next yeah. week after Easter. I just okay. realised I've got nobody helped me clean up today. Can you? I can't hear you, Roy. You just lost you. Okay, Epi Berry, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what's going. On. Thank you very much. Wonderful session, enjoyable. Thank you. Um, and I attended a webinar of World Chefs yesterday. Very interesting. I'd be interested to hear more about that. Thank you very much, Hazel. Um, great. Thank you very much for your feedback. Oh, well, nuggets. Well, ball for adults. Yes, that would be a great one. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Thank you so much uh, for your feedback. Uh, yes, that's a good one. Welk nuggets. That's a very good idea. Um, Hazel, yeah, love to see the link to that. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. And please come back next week. You calm me down, you help me to sleep Your head on my shoulder, there's a shot of your heat Oh, this love is big